Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's webinar. My name is Kapil, and I am a part of the marketing team here at EDB. I'll be your host for today's session on ensuring your business is always on with EDB BDR. I'm joined today by, by Boris Mayas, a solution architect at EDB. Before we start with today's session, I just want to go through a few housekeeping items. The presentation is being recorded. We will share the recording along with the slides with you after the session. The lines are currently muted. If you have any questions, please feel uh, free to submit them in the Q&A panel. Uh, our speaker will address the questions toward the end of the session. If we do not have time to address all the questions, we will follow up with uh, afterwards with any attendee whose question was not answered. Uh, now, without any further ado, over to you, Boris. Thanks a lot, Kapil, and uh, thanks everybody for attending. I'm, I'm very happy to be uh, giving this webinar because it's the second webinar that we are going to be doing um, in APJ area regarding the same topic. The first one, if you were able to attend, it was about uh, replication, and I'm going to talk a little bit about that one. And we discussed physical replication, and we started to discuss logical replication. And one of the requests after we started doing that topic, it was to uh, present BDR, bidirectional replication, and we are going to see how everything actually connects with, with, with everything. So that's the idea here. And um, something very important about BDR is actually about everything in names is, is, is uh, naming things is one of the most difficult thing in, in, in computer science or in informatics in general. And the fact that the B is there, it is very important because uh, this is bi-directional replication. So if you need to evaluate any solution that involves replication between nodes, the fact that makes BDR different from the others, it is the fact that it is bi-directional. So it goes um, with multiple masters, going in, in, in multiple directions. So we're going to see how this builds up into multiple directions, but it's, it's the main thing that makes it different from the, the rest of the strategies for, for replication. Um, because it's APJ, we're going to be talking about a topic that I think it is interesting for people living in the APJ area. I hope that I, that I match that uh, correctly. Um, so uh, we can also discuss about that topic during the, the question sessions. Um, so. Um, previously on APJ webinars, uh, at least in the, the webinar that I gave before, we look at this tree, the tree of replication in PostgreSQL. Okay? We saw that the roots of uh, replications, it is based on backup and recovery, as you can see here. Yeah? And from that root, you can build up a physical replication, which is actually physical streaming replication. It's a constant flow from one node to the other node unidirectional, that's important. The primary node sends data to uh, the standby nodes, and the standby nodes can actually send data to other nodes. So that's a kind of a variation of physical replication. And then we will go to this part of the tree and we have cascading replication, okay? But it's also possible to have um, a little bit of more guarantees when you do replication and you have a synchronous replication to make sure that every time that you write into a node, it is uh, a synchronization between these two nodes, and you know that when you commit, it is at least in two nodes or more. And it depends on how you configure. So this is the other side of the of your branch. But this is all physical replication that kind of extends to uh, different possibilities. Something that was added later, it was logical decoding, a, a logical representation of your data that is being sent to the other nodes. And this is done through logical replication. And this thing, makes it possible because it's a logical representation and not a physical one to exchange data between Postgres running different versions. For instance, running version 9.4 and then version 10, then from version 10 to version 13. So this actually opened the door for upgrading major upgrades from one version to the other or moving from a Windows server to a Linux server. Um, and, and without having a an important downtime. So this will allow you to have a nearly zero downtime uh, upgrade. Okay, that's one of the main features for logical replication, but also to exchange data between different nodes in a different way, okay? Now, the important thing here, and this is where we stop uh, the previous uh, webinar, it is that logical replication, actually, it is the door that allows you to do bi-directional replication. And 
by putting the action in the bidirectional replication, it means that until here, all this tree is actually unidirectional. Okay, data flows from one node to the other nodes. And this actually gives you a lot of guarantees like um, having one source of truth, which means that um, all the others know how to follow. The fact that it's bidirectional replication, it means that we are going to face all the challenges. It gives us more opportunities, but also challenges, because now we now have to deal with conflicts. Because if data goes in two directions, uh, there is no one single source of truth. So we have to make sure that we either avoid conflict or we solve conflict. Yeah, this is kind of like with human behavior. Um, you have some conflicts, and um, sometimes you have to avoid it, but in some situations, it's not possible in how you have to solve the conflict. Very important to life. Yeah. So um, let's talk about cricket. I think this is something that is going to be interesting for many of you. Uh, at least I find it very, very interesting as, uh, as a sport. It's, a, it's a very nice to, to, to watch, and especially the 2020. Um, uh, I, and I just uh, knew I'm new to, to, to cricket. So, um, um, uh, the 2020s is the thing that excites me more. I, I also like to follow the test tickets, uh, the test matches, but um, they're a little bit too long. Uh, they are nice to check from time to time how, how it's going with that. But, uh, but I think 2020s are, are, are more interesting to watch. And now we have the World Cup again. Anyway, be the art cricket. What is this? This is actually a use case, fictional use case, for the best daily reports on cricket. This is a company that provides you news um, with cricket news. So it needs to have a very good database in order to provide you all the results, all the reviews, and to have everybody up to date about uh, cricket news. So in this use case, you can see here, we have a, a map of uh, APJ area. Uh, we have uh, BDR cricket, which has servers running on Bangalore, Mumbai, and in, in India. And then if we go down here to the south, we have Melbourne and Sydney. Okay. So Imagine for a moment that you have a server in Bangalore, which is where everything started for BDR cricket. All the reporters were in India covering all the news about cricket in India. And then it got uh, so popular that people from uh, Australia also start checking the news reports from, from India's cricket. So for the people from Mumbai, it is close uh, to, to check the server. So everything went very smoothly, but for the people from Australia, um, it took a little bit longer. I mean, you, you can think like, ah, okay, but this is just physical distance. We are talking about internet. Internet is very fast. Okay, internet is very fast, but it cannot go faster than speed of light. There are some physical limitations there. I'm sorry about it. Uh, but um, yeah, it increased latency. And latency is important when you are using an application, when everything is going so fast now. Um, people don't want to have a very slow um, server. So this kind of could affect you somehow. Uh, if you're reading, not that much, but if you're writing, probably yes. So uh, what uh, what you want to do now is that your reporters then that are going to start writing not only about the news of Indian cricket, but about Australian cricket, uh, cricket as well, and, and the entire world, actually. What we're going to do is that we are going to have another server where you can write in Australia, in this case, in Sydney. So this is going to reduce your latency for writes and for read, of course, uh, because you're going to be able to talk to the node that is closer to you. Okay, so and now we're going to, to go here with the um, a drawing pad. And uh, let's imagine here on the left, we have uh, an application here, which is connected to a server. Yeah, so this is the, your database. And on the other side, you have also your application here. And you have another local server here, which is for reads, okay? So whenever you read something, it's going to be very fast. And this is with replication, which is unidirectional, yeah? Everything that you write something here on this node is going to be sent to this node. So this one can be read by this node very fast, no problem there. However, if this one wants to write something, it cannot write it here because it's a, it's a, it's a read-only node, okay? So it has to always write there. And then if this one has a one millisecond latency, this one might have a 150 milliseconds latency and, and it's not so nice. So with BDR, what we are going to have, it is the possibility that both nodes are going to be able to write. And now we, I have 
Goji put the two arrows here. So this is a bidirectional. So this is BDR nodes now. Writes can also happen here. So all the writes are going to have only one millisecond. And then there is going to be an asynchronous exchange of data here between nodes done with logical replication. So this is basically how, how it works, okay? Logical replication, replication, okay? So um, if we are talking about uh, India here and we're talking about Australia here, you can see that the um, latency, it is going to be more important as if you have only two uh, nodes and in, in very located very, very closely, okay? So when we have the first use case, it's geo-redundancy. And in this case, for BDR Cricket News, it is very important to have uh, not only the users um, that are reading the news, but also the reporters accessing their servers very, very fast. Now, uh, we told you on the abstract of this presentation that we were going to do a demo. And uh, what we're going to see is exactly this, yeah? How we can write in two places without having um, my major latency. Of course, I don't have a servers running in, in those places, but I do have here a simulation where I have uh, four nodes, actually. We are going to build up this um, uh, little by little. But imagine that we have here um, a node in Bangalore. You can see here Bangalore, which is my node in, in white. And we have another one in Melbourne here, which is the node in blue chrome. I'm going to use Sydney here. Sydney, which is the larger size. Okay, so um, uh, for the fonts, so it's easier to read. So let's go to Bangalore. And you can see my, the name of my database is called BDR Cricket. Uh, the spelling is coming from the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, by the way. So, um, let me create a table then. So, um, because DDLs are also replicated in BDR. So, let me begin a transaction. What I'm going to do here is I'm going to say create a table, which is called key value, which contains a, a key, which is a big integer. And this is very important. This integer is going to be a primary key. Why is important? Because in logical replication, you need to identify every row that you are modifying because otherwise there is no way for the other nodes to identify which one you are updating or deleting. If you're inserting, it's fine. Uh, in data that is flowing, only growing, there's no problem. But when you need to modify data, you need to identify it, okay? So for logical replication, and this is independent of uh, BDR or not, you need to identify your uh, rows, okay? Because it's a logical representation with an ID. Yeah? Otherwise you can just do insert only. It's possible, but you're limited with the possibilities. Okay, so we have a key and then a value, which is also a big integer, okay? Um, by the way, if I go to uh, Sydney and uh, let me go here, and I describe tables. Well, you see, this is the BDR cricket. So I do have already some tables for uh, some match that contain some um, innings, and the innings uh, contain some uh, overs, and every match has a scores. Yeah? So this is for reporting on the um, on the cricket match. So I'm going to create another table. Yes, and I'm going to do a commit now. Boom! It is committed, and if I go here on this other node. I can see that the key value table is now there available, you see? So DDLs are also replicated in BDR in a way that is um, uh, automatic. You don't have to do anything special. This is just normal uh, DDL. I just do create table as I would do with a normal node, okay? And now you can say, okay, well, this is just exactly like a primary standby node. It goes from one direction to the other. By the way, I'm using here um, BDR version so that you know. We are using version 3.7.11, okay? And this is uh, Postgres um, uh, 13, okay? Now, let me show you everything from this table. It, it's just created, so it shouldn't have anything on it, and it's exactly nothing there. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to begin a transaction here. Let me get back here to the top. This is, remember, uh, the node in Sydney, and I'm going to do, uh, so you can see here, root Sydney. Um, insert into key value, then the values are going to be 42 and 1984. References to books. It's very good to, to read uh, in your daily life. Um, it's important to increase your, uh, not, not just increase your knowledge, I mean, reading is fun, uh, and so, um, 
yeah, I, I enjoy reading books. So I, I, I like to share not just what I know about uh, Postgres, but also what I, what I do as fun. And um, so um, that's why I'm telling you that I, I like reading books. So now I'm going to read here, uh, not the book, but the table, key value. Key value, yep. And you can see that the value is being inserted. So I created the table in Bangalore, but I wrote the data on Singapore. No, Sydney, sorry, Sydney. Uh, I can also insert here data because it's bi-direction. Uh, so begin insert into key value and then values. And then let's pick at other values from books, 1984 now, but then room 101. And then I do commit. Okay, good. And I go to Melbourne now. And then in Melbourne, I'm going to select everything from key value. And you can see that both data are there. So no matter if I write in Bangalore or in Sydney, the data also gets to the other node in Melbourne. So everything goes in all directions as possible. Yeah. So same thing here, select everything from uh, key value. Again, I inserted only one value here, uh, but the other value was being inserted in the other node. So data is flowing everywhere. And as you can see, I didn't do anything special in terms of a SQL code. I just did normal SQL as if it was running in one single node. So this is actually uh, running uh, bidirectionally. Um, so let's get back to, to our slide. So I got your redundancy, the latency is much shorter and um, you have already one use case where you would like to use BDR if you need it, okay? So we're going to explore now other cases where you would need um, geo redundancy. Okay, or uh, BDR, sorry, not just for geo redundancy. And we are going to explain global sequences because this is one source of um, problem for um, having uh, conflicts, okay? So and this is one of the important things that you need to understand that when you're writing in two different places, the data that is being exchanged here between two nodes can have conflicts. So let, let's see. Uh, a normal example here. Um, let me open another page. When you have data uh, in, a, in a table, yeah, let's say the, the same one that I have uh, with an ID, a key, which is just a number, but the ID is is a sequence that is always increasing, and a value, yeah. So this one is a sequence. Okay, usually the sequence could go from uh, one to uh, infinite, but well, not actually infinite, whatever your computer is allowing you to, to give you all the data type that you're using, okay? So it's going to be growing. If you insert this and you let the system to uh, give you the next value, it's always going to increase like one, two, three, four, you know how numbers work, and it's going to continue increasing. The problem is that if I write this in India, and at the same time, I write this in Australia, and I also start doing my new values with one, two, three. In this case, I explicitly put the values 42 and 1984 as the two different keys. But if I have two sequences, whenever I send this data across, they're going to complain. They're going to say, oh, but I already have one. Yeah, and the other one is, so I already have two. So this is already going to give you some uh, conflict and you have to either two choices. First choice is synchronize everything. Yeah, so every time that you're going to write a new value, you send to the other, hey, I'm going to write a new value. I say, okay, you can use number two and then you synchronize for the next one. But this is going to be too expensive. And when I mean too expensive, I don't mean in terms of money, I mean in terms of resources, time, um, uh, network communication. And the time is actually the, the worst thing here. Everything that is replicated that needs to have a kind of locking mechanism it requires a lot of effort from the machines in order to have a protocol that gets a consensus and that they agree upon. So this actually makes it unusable, okay? So because this thing of synchronizing everything is not usable, so I would say here, not usable, yep. Yeah. You need to have a different way of, uh, of approaching this. Imagine that you are two persons and if you have to call each other just to define uh, the, what is the next number to do something, 
it's never going to, to, to work. So the second approach is to have an agreement ahead. So, and we are going to call this a global sequence. And with an agreement that is going to say like, okay, India is going to be using from one to one million. And Australia is going to be using from one million and one up to two million. So now I can use all this range knowing that I'm never going to conflict with the other side. And this one is never going to conflict with the other side. The only moment that I need to synchronize between us is this point. Whenever I reach my border, then we are going to have another consensus to agree what is going to be the next range. Maybe there is no just India and Australia. Maybe next time it's going to be India, Australia, New Zealand. And then we need to have another third range in order to do this. Okay, so this is what we call a globally allocated uh, sequence or GALOC for the friends. Yeah. And uh, the idea is that you synchronize only when it's necessary. And this synchronization is going to be done with an algorithm called Raft. Yeah. There's all the algorithms like uh, Paxos, for instance. In BDR, we use Raft. And the other moment that you also need to use this kind of global agreement between nodes and that can arrive to a consensus is when you create tables, for instance, or you do DDLs that are important because DDLs are heavier things that everybody has to agree that there is a table called key value, for instance. In this case, everybody agrees that there is a global sequence spread between these two people. Yep. So these are global sequences. Now, the other way to do it is the following, and this is what I'm going to demonstrate you now. Let's say that because we have big integers, we can do something like this. We use first the time that you're writing something, a timestamp, plus all these nodes that we have on the, on the BDR diagram. Yeah, let's say that we're going to have all of them. They have a number, a way to identify themselves. Yeah, so number one, two, three, four, whatever number. And then within that number, so this is going to make it unique. So we're going to have a timestamp, a node ID. And so this is unique globally because of the node ID. Yeah, so this is, this is crucial. And then within that, we're going to allow to have uh, per millisecond, uh, 8,000 and something uh, numbers. Yeah, and we're going to call this uh, time sharded um, sequence. That means that because I have a unique value here, I don't need to coordinate with the other nodes. So this allows me to have something that is never going to conflict between the two nodes. So if I get back to the, to the previous page, whenever I send something from one side to the other, because it contains my ID, it's never going to conflict with this other node. So this is too much theory. Uh, let's see it in, in the demonstration. So remember, we have these two nodes that we want to avoid conflict between them. So we are going to have and let me look at this table here now. Describe table uh, match. I do have here an ID, which is a big integer, which contains a next value, which comes from a sequence, okay? And it also contains uh, two teams, the home and the way, a match where the, team, the match is being played, and the form of the match. So you have a test match, and, uh, one day international, and those kind of matches, okay? And this one, when I created it, I created it as a time sharded uh, sequence. Okay. So look, let me uh, let me find my, my code here. What do I have? Here it is. If you are aware or not, um, let me do it here in Bangalore or, or in, in Mumbai. I'm going to insert into the table match the home team, the away team. This is going to be England and India. They are playing today. Uh, the fourth match in the series that, uh, of the Tour of India. Been really good. It's one, one victory for England, one victory for India, and one draw. And there are still two, two test matches to play. So very exciting. And they're going to be playing today. I'm not giving the ID here, OK? Uh, okay, well, this is complaining about uh, committed most ones. I'm going to explain you later what, what that is. But the important thing here is that it's, it inserted the value. 
So let's have a look at that value. Select everything from match. Good. So this is the data that I just inserted and I have something that is going to give me a unique identifier of a sequence in the entire system. So I'm avoiding conflicts between nodes, yeah? Um, so, okay, I got that one, very good. Now what I'm going to uh, do is not just insert everything that is about um, today, but um, in Melbourne, they're going to, let me do it with begin so that we don't see that error. I'm going to insert also another match, okay? Where the home team was uh, Bangladesh and the away team was Australia and they play on the 6th of August, another victory for Bangladesh in this series of 2020 internationals preparing for the, for the World Cup. Yeah, so I inserted the value blue on black. It's not very easy to read, so I'm going to read this value on the other node on Sydney. So now I can do select everything from match. Okay, so I'm writing everywhere, but the good thing is that I don't care about the ID, how it's generated. I know that there is no conflict between them because this, conf this uh, value contains my node ID. How do I know that? Okay, so let me use the following function. I can do now, not just select everything from, from, from the match, but I'm going to do uh, select BDR extract node ID from the time chart. I told you that this was a time chart, not a global sequence. I think it's more interesting to see this one instead of the globally allocated. I mean, you can imagine how the nodes are going to synchronize for the for the integers. This one, is, I think, is cooler. Uh, and then everything from uh, match. Well, there you go. So this is the same information from the second line to the other one that you, that you just saw here. But in this one, I can know that this first value between uh, England and India was added on the node three, which was the node in Mumbai. And this one was added on the node one so i can know the source of the data and this is what makes it unique and this is how i can avoid conflict between the nodes right uh, i can also not just do the um, node id from what i got it but i can also extract the timestamp actually from that particular value so extract the timestamp yeah uh, is it correctly spelled this yes from uh, the time shard id Oop. and i will note now that it was actually, uh, well, this is the time that I'm in UTC, yep, when I inserted the data, 2nd of September, 2021, 20, okay? So you can get plenty of information from this value. Yep. It's also very good for uh, table partitioning and, and all that kind of stuff. So uh, now you can see that I can write with sequences that avoid conflict between the nodes. So this is something that allows you, uh, that BDR provides you to write data without having conflict. Because conflict is one of the most difficult things when you have multiple sources of truth. And I wanted to show you that particular example to see the capabilities of, of BDR. Because I mean, the other demonstration, you know, I mean, it's working um, in writing in multiple directions. So what else is, is to show? Well, it works. Um, so I thought that this, this time chart was interesting. Now, in the same thing that I did with the key value table, I also have here a primary key, yeah? So whenever I update any of this value, I can use the ID yeah, to um, modify the thing. So let's say that it wasn't really on the 6th of August, but it was actually on the, on the 7th of August. I think, I think it was actually 7 of August. So let, let's, let's do that. So, um, uh, begin. Oh, I need to have a look at select star from match. Begin, and then we'll say update match set play on as uh, 2021. This is not correct. It was six of August, but let, let, let's do an example where ID equals. And this is the ID. Boom. Commit. Jim. And now, if I go to any other node here, select star from match, you can see that updates are also replicated across multiple nodes. So, no matter where I write 
the data is synchronized everywhere. And as you can see, it's not a matter of uh, minutes of synchronization. Everything happens in terms of uh, as fast as it can with milliseconds. Okay. Okay. So let's get back to to slides. So I wanted to show you that you can do geo redundancy and you can have global sequences in BDR that allows you to have uh, conflict less data on your on your BDR nodes because you have multiple sources of truth. So whenever you do a project with BDR, you have to think about how you're going to resolve conflicts. Okay. Okay. Um, before we go into this one, um, know that whenever there is a conflict here in in in, in BDR, uh, BDR also have some conflict resolvers that automatically are going to decide which one is the value that have to be applied in the entire cluster. And by default, it is the last one wins. Okay, So if I insert the same value in two different places, the last one actually wins. So let, let me show you yeah, that just that now. So if I do begin um, insert into key value, yeah, um, and then I'm going to put the values. I'm going to be, now let, let me just do a simple one, one and one. Okay, cool. And then in Mumbai, I do uh, begin and I do insert into key value, and then the values are going to be one and zero. So these are two conflicting values. And usually, if this was exactly the same machine, this is going to lock between two nodes because they are both trying to get the lock for the row that has a primary key one. But because these two things are running in two different places, yeah. There is no global locking actually happening between the, these two nodes whenever you write something. So this is important to understand. What is going to happen is that the last one that I commit is actually going to uh, give me the uh, the last value. So um, also they're, they're fighting uh, for, for the lock. We're going to see uh, the output of the, that one at the end. So the last one that wins is, uh, is going to uh, give me the last result. Should have probably don't, don't conflict these two because this is camo partners. Uh, I'm going to explain you that a little bit later. So um, I want to show you the conflict uh, resolution in a minute. Before we go to that, let me uh, explain you a little bit more about um, always on, which is the architecture that we promote a lot, which is not just geo redundancy, it allows you to have your business always running. So you already understood the concept of always on. Here you have a node running in the north, which is in India, and a node running in the south. Yeah, they both connect to their server, one which is running in Bangalore and the other one which is running in uh, Sydney. Yeah, and they have bidirectional replication between them. They have conflict resolutions and everything. Um, now, um, of course, if one of these nodes fails, let's say that the node in Sydney fails, the users in, in Sydney will have to go to the node in Bangalore. Yeah. Again, coming back to the original situation, having a lot, long latency. So this is not that robust. I mean, it's very good already, but it's not that robust. And so what we want to have is that in India, we're going to have two nodes, which is also a BDR node here. So there is also bidirectional replication between the node in Bangalore and the node in Mumbai which also replicates to the node in Sydney, right? And the same thing by adding another node in Melbourne, right? Now we have directions, bi-directionals uh, going everywhere. The reason that I draw all the arrows here is to make explicit the fact that you need to have uh, actually a lot of CPU usage to synchronize everything, yeah? And you can call this a ring, actually, a full mesh ring. This is one ring to rule them all, one ring to find them, one ring to bring them all, and in the network binds them, okay? So this ring is going to allow you to synchronize everything in everywhere, but it requires a lot of CPU power. Now, the good thing of this is that if the node in Sydney, which I was telling you, could fail, I don't have to go all the way up to India. I can say like, okay, I had disconnected from my node, I reconnect to the other node that is closer to me and I can continue writing stuff, yeah? These other nodes are going to wait and uh, to synchronize with the node in, in, in Sydney. And whenever the node is back, they're going to send the data uh, afterwards. So that's a good thing, yeah? So you don't have to uh, stop writing because the one of the master nodes failed. 
Okay. So that's this is the principle of uh, always on. Once you have this, actually, you don't have to fail back to this node here. This is what we call uh, a lead master and a shadow master. Yeah. So this is the lead master and the shadow master. And whenever the, the lead master is not available, you can talk to the shadow master, and this will actually become the lead master now. Yeah. So if you ever see this this nomenclature in BDR explanations, lead master and shadow master, they're both masters. Yeah. Both primary nodes. It's just that one of them is the one that is being used for writes, and this is to avoid conflict. If you're always writing to the two of them, you will need to have more conflict resolution, and this is not going to be uh, very nice. So if you write only one node, you prevent those uh, conflicts. So there is a lot of uh, conflict um, prevention here in, in, in BDR. And uh, okay, so the other reason that I don't need to do a failback here is because this, this node it has to be the same capacity of these other nodes, same amount of CPU, same amount of RAM. So any of the node can actually be uh, my lead master from the area. Okay. By the way, uh, this is the south, and you know, not because it's down on the screen, because up and down for north and south is just a human convention because we draw maps. There's no up and down in the universe. But you can see that this is south because you have the, the, the southern cross here. And so if you live in the northern hemisphere, uh, you you don't you never see this at the night you only see this from chile or australia or new zealand and this is the uh, nebulosa de magallanes magallanes is also something that you can see on the south that's why you know that this is south and this is north okay so these four nodes this ring here this full match is towards the architecture bdr always on there are some other components that we're going to see but remember this first four because this is the main core of bdr always on Okay, that's why I'm being using four nodes at the moment. And we're going to see Calm as well. So uh, in the original diagram, we have only two nodes providing bidirectional replication, and the other servers are just going to connect and, and, and follow here. But now what we're going to add is that everybody talks to everybody, and here the arrows don't look very nice, but I needed to put all the arrows so that you can see how things is going everywhere. Okay, so that's important. Now, in Cricket, when you, you know, the bowler sends the well, balls, yeah, and 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 the, the batter actually intercepts the the ball. Uh, you need to have an umpire who actually decides whether the, that ball was going to hit the stamps or not. And you need to have a very good eye to say like, oh, this this ball was actually going to hit the stamp, so this is actually a wicket. Um, or whether uh, the ball just passes, and then whether the the bowler, uh, the batsman, actually touch uh, with the edge of the bat uh, the ball, and is being caught by 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 one of the fielder, whether this is a wicket or not, right? So you need to have an umpire. In BDR, what you need to have, or what is actually nice to have, is a witness, yeah, which we are going to put in New Zealand, which is also connected to all the other nodes. It's also a BDR node, but it doesn't have any data on it. So it's not a real player. It is just observing everything. So whenever there is a disconnection between India and Australia and the other users that are in Pakistan or, or Singapore or Bangladesh and are also checking the news for BDR cricket, they want to know where is the real um, cluster still running. And that's why they're going to have a majority with the witness, either here in Australia or the two nodes in India with the witness to decide, okay, this is the cluster that is going to continue. So the same problem that you used to have with the split brain, when you have like a, a standby that is promoted and you have had two masters, you need to avoid it uh, when you have two clusters on, on BDR. And that's why you have the witness node here, which is now in New Zealand. Okay. So this is going to start adding more roles to your BDR always on architecture, little by little. Okay, but meanwhile, let, let me get back to, to, to our demonstration. So this one timeout because of camo. If I don't have camo here, there is no timeout needed here, but uh, um, what is important here is that um, conflict resolution, what it is, is that the last one that was inserted, which was uh, uh, this one when I did commit, is the one that is being kept. Yeah. And here you select start from uh, key value. Is also one. So if I check the same table in all the nodes, 
although there was a conflict, they all agree with the same value. Yeah. And if there is a disconnection between these two nodes and there is a conflict, the um, witness is going to help you actually also to, to decide where is the logs taken and whenever you have a DDLs and stuff like that. So that's why it's also important here. You can see that all the nodes got exactly the same version of the table, which is what you actually want in, um, in BDR. So what we can do here is to check a table called, and this is advanced stuff, but I'm going to show you anyway, because I think that it's important that you understand how BDR works from BDR dot conflict history. Yeah, well, I did, I did some tests before, but um, uh, here it is. So what it's telling me here is that I have a conflict here with two tuples. One that it was saying that the key is one, the other one is also saying the key is one. One says that the value is zero and the other one says that the value is one. So they are conflicting. But the conflict resolver tells me that I have to skip here because my value, yeah, the local tuple, commit time, is more recent by three seconds than the remote time. So BDR decided that this one is a newer value, so this is the winner. And it resolves the conflict and you don't have to do anything. It is being uh, resolved, okay? So this is uh, the second record on the conflict line. In Mumbai, which is the other node that was having the conflict, select start from uh, bdr.conflict history. Exactly the same thing. In this case, I have again the two tuples. The only difference here is that the resolution for this node is different because my local tuple now is earlier in time than this one, yeah? So because the last one wins, the remote one wins here. So my conflict resolution is actually apply remote. So I'm deciding that the other one wins. So this is the one that I have to apply. And that's why it says here, apply tuple, the one one. And the other one, it says like skip because I win. So I don't have to care about the other remote value that is being sent. So these are automatic conflict resolvers that you get with BDR. So what does BDR give you when you have a conflict? It gives you a, um, a conflict resolution that is going to decide for you what's the best solution, but you can tune it, you can decide your own stuff. You can select local always wins, or depending on some other rules, you can apply different stuff, okay? Uh, so this is how BDR actually attempts to solve most of the cases that we, we see in, in customers that are already being used in BDR for, for a few years already. So um, DDLs, conflict resolution, global sequences, those are things that you definitely need when you have um, multiple direction, uh, multiple things that are, that are being uh, written in different uh, nodes, so different source of truth. Yeah, so you have to deal with that. Now, in the last minutes, the last few minutes that we have, let me go to this architecture that I know that is kind of a, a whole bunch of nodes and roles. But remember that we had a first uh, core of four nodes. Yeah. So I said the left side is India and the right side is Australia. So you have these two nodes here that are Mumbai and, and Bangalore. And these two nodes are Sydney and Melbourne. Yeah. So you have the first ring made with the four nodes that we put in the beginning. And this is your core ring. Okay. You can already work with this. But if you want to have more robustness, more um, uh, stability and uh, being really, really always on, depending on the needs of your, of your system, you need to have a witness node that is going to allow you to decide if there is a disconnection between data center A and B, which one of the data center is actually running, okay? So this is at, at this extra node here in New Zealand. Now, um, Backup and recovery, we told you from the beginning that is at the base of physical replication. You can also have a Barman node, which is here, and these two components here. In order to have a physical replication here, you have here physical streaming replication to have exact copy of the lead master whenever you need to rebuild it 
uh, from, 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 from scratch, yeah? But rebuilding a physical copy of a node, it is sometimes uh, not the fastest way of recovering the node. So that's why we have this other node here, which is the logical standby, which is also a BDR node. Yeah, it also uses, so you see the link here is BDR. It also uh, uses logical replication. That's why it's called logical standby, but it's not part of the entire ring. Why it's not part of the entire ring? Because you want to avoid having that massive amount of communication between all the nodes. It is going to be kind of a too much if you add uh, six nodes. Remember how the arrows are going to be starting to, to, to be added. But why do we have these nodes here? Well, if any of these two masters dies and is unrecoverable, instead of building it from the backup recovery server, we can just promote this logical standby, which is ready there and say, okay, this is a new master and it becomes part of your system immediately. So you recover your fault tolerance factor very quickly because these nodes are usually very large nodes, uh, terabytes of data. So recreating that can take time. Of course, it can be also gigabytes, but it depends on how fast you want to recover. So now you understand a little bit more. So the first four nodes that are in your ring, plus the witness node, a backup recovery server, and two, reserve players that are there just to replace the bowler or, or the batsman very quickly instead of uh, having the, the player go through the entire process of recovery. Now, the applications here, they don't connect directly to your master node. Yeah, they connect through a combo here, PG Bouncer and HA Proxy, which is actually redirecting you either to the lead master or the shadow master. Yeah, so this is kind of the entry point just to decide that you go to only one of these two to avoid conflicts and, uh, and stuff like that. Yep. And whenever you want to do maintenance in one of the nodes, the thing is being changed here for, for going to the other master node. So things are more transparent for the application. The application doesn't have to reconfigure anything. It just goes through a PG bouncer and HA proxy and it goes further. Right. So that's always on architecture. So you, uh, you understand now um, how multi master works, how bidirectional works, how conflicts resolvers work. It's a lot of stuff. We can see all the stuff in detail if you want in a different session. Um, there's only one extra concept that I want to explain to you now, which is called CAMO, the commit at most once, right? Because this is very important, especially for um, financial uh, system, financial institutions, yep. So uh, we saw time shards and, and stuff like that to avoid conflict and, and things, but this is a different concept. Your application here, let's say that it goes through the um, PG Bouncer here. It's going to talk to one of your BDR servers, yeah? When it writes data and you say commit, as I've been doing in every of the um, demonstrations, this is sent back saying like, okay, commit. And then asynchronously, it sends a message to the other BDR node, okay? And then you have uh, the other BDR node here. All the arrows going everywhere. I'm not going to draw them all, but you know, this, this is a the synchronous communication that goes everywhere. The problem with asynchronous communication is that you say commit and then says okay, and then it fails. It might be that this data was never sent to the other nodes. And in financial stuff, if this is one dollar or one 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 uh, Australian dollar, or I don't know the, the currency in India actually, um, yeah, probably it's not that relevant if you lose that one. But if this is a lot more money, you don't want this to be uh, actually lost, okay? If it is transfer of, uh, of data. So you don't want to have asynchronous communication. What you actually want to have is before you get, uh, let me move this, the okay, you want to have a synchronous communication here. So at least one of these nodes tells you okay, and then you say okay here, right? Commit. You send here, this one says okay, and this one says okay back, and then you're happy. Yeah. Good. Now imagine the following situation. You send commit here. Yeah. This one says okay. So you know that it's committed, the data is also here. But before it's being sent here, boom, there is a crash. There's a problem here. The connection is broken. So this one is now not happy anymore where it's kind of like in a suspicious uh, situation. It's like, huh? what happened to my node? Huh? What happened to my commit? So what, what's going on? 
the usual thing that you would do is that you uh, reinsert the data and then it's going to be duplicated and you get an error and all this stuff. But if you are transferring money and you send $100 to a different account and then you send commits and you don't know what happened, you don't want to send it again because you're going to duplicate the data and, and that's also bad. So there is an uncertainty here. Yeah, What you want to have is something that is still done because then you can, if this node was really gone, the next time you're going to connect here, oh, sorry, let me use another arrow. And you want to do commit only if this commit didn't succeed. So this, this is why we say commit at most once. So commit only if this one failed, yeah? That's the situation that you want to have. And I'm not going to explain all the details, but this is a quote that I took from Tom Kinkett. This committed mode once, it enables your application to remove the ambiguity of an unsuccessful commit. So whenever your commit, it is being issued, but you don't know what happened with it, you have this uncertain ambiguity. What, 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 how, what's going on? What's going on? And then um, what is going to happen is that with commit at most once, you remove this uh, uncertainty. And I know that I'm going running a little bit of out of time for questions, but I want to show you this. So let me, let me do the following. So begin, and then I'm going to do the following. I'm going to do select. And there is one way of knowing who is my node, yeah, from a table called node summary. Yeah. So this is my global identifier of the node in Bangalore, okay? And I'm also want to know which is my transaction here. Select uh, takes ID uh, current, my current transaction. And I know that this number, yeah? So I'm running this transaction on this node, yeah? If I go back here to this diagram, I have now two values. I have the transaction ID and I know in which node I'm running my commit, okay? I'm going to insert now into key value, and then I'm going to use the values are um, 666 um, and 9,666, 9, which is what a big fire in London. And then I'm going to say commit. For some reason, now I know that it's okay, it's fine, but let's say that I failed that commit and I want to know what's going on with this. So I have these two values here. Yeah, so let me copy this one. Let me go to, to Mumbai, yeah? So what I'm going to do now, it is... Um, oh, I don't have the value of uh, this one. It is called uh, select BDR. And it's a function in BDR that is going to allow me... Uh, let me see, find it here. To understand what is the status of this uh, particular transaction, which is called logical transaction status is a logical transaction of this node and then i need to get the number and it tells me committed oh hi so i reduce the ambiguity so what i'm doing now is that with this information that i gather before doing commit I send this information to this node, say like, hey, can you tell me what's happened with this transaction on this node? Actually, the other, the, other, the other order. And this is going to tell me, oh, uh, it was okay, or it's aborted. And if it was aborted, then I can decide to commit again. So that this is how we achieve commit at most once, which is a feature that is very important when you have multiple sources of truth. Okay, so it remove the ambiguity of an unsuccessful commit. In this case, it was successful, but um, I wanted to show you how you do it. So let's sum it up. Postgres allows you to do replication, starting from backup recovery to go to physical replication, multiple ways of doing physical replication, but then you add logical decoding that allows you to identify a row and then do multiple things with it in other nodes. If you mix them and you add this BDR software, together with some other extra stuff and in Postgres, it allows you to do bi-directional replication, yeah? And because it's bi-directional replication, you can have multiple ways of doing it as well. So always on, your redundancy, or commit at most once, you have multiple sources of truth, okay? 
And because you have multiple sources of truth, when you design your application, you have to be aware of not only the possibilities that this gives you, but also uh, things like conflict resolution and making sure that you commit at most once the data. Yeah. So it comes with great power, great responsibility to care about your data and, and, and do it in the right way with bidirectional replication. I'm not just selling you like, whoa, this is wonderful, fantastic. It is, but you need to be careful about how you're going to deal with your data. So actually, I shouldn't say but. It is like, it is a great thing. And you have to make sure that uh, you write your data uh, consistently everywhere. Okay. It's very good for geo-redundancy. It provides you DDLs automatically. It provides you conflict resolution automatically. And it gives you um, a lot of fun and joy in your life. And it also provides you a very complex architecture that can be simpler than this one, but I show you the, the most complex one that you can have uh, building up things little by little. You know, so I try to come up to this uh, architecture uh, step by step, okay, so you can understand everything. And apart from that, you also have uh, committed most ones, which is one of the main things that uh, you need for applications like financial. financial. Good. So that's all I wanted to tell you. It's a lot of information, uh, but you know, actually, uh, a lot about BDR now, and and we can always go into one of these topics more like a, in detail in another webinar, or if you have more questions, you can always ask uh, later on to me via the um, um, social media or send me an email uh, or contact the people from marketing, then the question is going to get to me. So we do have a few minutes for questions. So uh, Kapil, do, do we have questions? I, I didn't have a... Away, yes. to, to check the questions. Boris, uh, thank you very much for your session. Let's get started with the questions. Uh, first question is, how collision is managed in BDR? Okay, so I, I, I answered this question probably already um, when when I when I explained you the um, the this table, the uh, conflict history. So you saw that there is a conflict type. So when, whenever there is a conflicting stuff based on the key that identifies a row, and you have two different sources, like two updates that are uh, conflicting or an update and a delete, there is a type of conflict that is going to be identified and there is a resolution that is going to be taken by BDR and this is going to be kept on a table. So you have all the history of all the possible conflicts that you can have. Whenever you have this, you're going to know which one is the remote tuple the local tuple, which is the one that is being applied. Yeah. And all this, the entire row is there. So you can always extract this data and reapply it and modify it as you want. Okay. And you also have a lot of extra information, but this is the basic thing for preventing collision. There is no global locking when you write the data, except for DDLs in global sequences uh, when you have to synchronize. So the conflicts have to be resolved afterwards, after it happens. So this is an optimistic way of saying like, let's go. And whenever we identify a conflict, we resolve it afterwards. Yes, next question, please, Kabil. Another question related to the same topic is, does conflict resolution, uh, is conflict resolution affected by server time synchronization issue? Uh, yeah, so the idea is that the nodes have a, a unique source of, uh, for a time, so they have a clock, a universal clock, so that they synchronize. If there is one that is desynchronized and it's always later than the other one, it probably is going to win all the time in, in the source. But the, this is part of how you, you tune your, your the, the, the synchronization of the clock of the servers. So that might affect uh, that. But we rarely see that because it, it also has to happen that the changes are kind of occurring kind of the same time and you have this problem of clock synchronizations. But otherwise, uh, this kind of uh, solution is proven to be practical in, in most of the cases that we have deployed. Yeah. Okay, I think we have time for one last question. That is, what is the minimum version of EDB Postgres support uh, uh, BDR? Sorry, the minimum, what? The version minimum? of EDB post Postgres that supports BDR. The minimum version? Yes. Yeah, ah, so uh, I'm running here version 3.7, which is the one that we recommend now. And uh, this one is supported from version 
11 on. So version 11, 12, and 13. If you're running an older version of Postgres, you can always upgrade through logical replication. If you're running on version 9.4, you will need to have some intermediate steps. If you're running already version 10, you can go uh, directly from version 10 to, to one of the upper node, um, upper versions. The good thing is that, um, as well, as you know, uh, Enterprise DB and Second Quadrant are working uh, together since uh, a year almost. Um, EPAS is also supported on BDR. So if you need Oracle compatibility, you can also have Oracle compatibility with EPAS, yeah, the advanced server of uh, EDB, together with bidirectional replication. So this is also working together. So starting from version 11 on, um, I think you're, you're, you're okay. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much, Boris. I apologize for all these questions that we were unable to get to today. Uh, but that's the time. Uh, that's all the time that we have. Uh, thank you all for joining us for the webinar. Uh, we'll be sharing the recording along with the slides with you as soon as possible. I hope you have a great rest of your day. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Cheers.